We're going to look at the last three things from your favorite heretics uh, post that, that um, well, we've been looking at them, but the, now we're going to look at the last three three things. But before I get going, um, we mentioned I mentioned last week talking about the way that sometimes leaders only get involved with people's lives if they start getting out of stuff. And, you know, I, I, I said some stuff last week, but I started thinking about it throughout the week, and... I felt like I needed to say more, so I'm going to just real real briefly touch on this. Sometimes as a leader, you get so focused on putting out fires that you forget that there are more than just the problems. And so there will be people who are struggling that you just don't really have time for because you're too busy dealing with all the problems. And um, yes, some of the things that people lead the church for are, you know, some of them are serious, some of them are not serious. But ultimately, you have to remember that there's never going to be a church that doesn't have problems. There's never going to be leaders that don't make mistakes. So there has to be a, a, an understanding of, yes, there is a difference between a leader that made a mistake and a leader that's not doing their job. There's a huge difference between those two things. And I think that that's part of my problem with the with these these this PowerPoint that we've been going through is – they just put everything all together, and it's like, well, sometimes something's only wrong if it's said in the wrong attitude. Sometimes, you know, it's just, well, that person made a mistake. But what some people do is they're so used to being hurt by people that the instant that someone does something that is reminiscent of what a bad leader would do, they say, oh, this person is a bad leader, when the truth is they're not a bad leader. They just made a mistake. And so you have to come to a place of, be of being – if you go to church, you're going to be hurt. If you go to church, the leader will disappoint you sometime in your life. The, the the difference being, you know, is everything pissing you off or, you know, so basically are you trying to live in a delusional world where nobody ever makes mistakes, in which case you don't even belong in it? Or is it something where there actually is something to complain about? I think that we do need to work real hard to, to, to distinguish that in our own minds because we, we do very much so, um, you know – Kind of make it all about us. So some of these complaints are true because people always mess up and fail to be perfect. Grace is usually not given by people who wish they had grace given to them. That's the thing that I that I think is kind of ironic in all this. Some of us have really good reason in the past to leave church. And a lot of my generation have taken that, that, that step to leave the church. But the thing is, is it's like you are wanting them to give you grace and you're not willing to give them grace. That's kind of a, a bit of a... Well, a contradiction. It's something that we all have to be be careful for, and it's hard because you don't want to dismiss this argument because my generation is so concerned about it that they're they're willing to just give up on God and the church and everything. So it's worth looking at, but uh, so yeah. Victims become victim makers. Oftentimes, you you see people who've gone through really bad childhood trauma, for instance, uh, grow up to. Try and give trauma to as many people as they can. <laughs> um, the church is in a very unhealthy place. I'm sorry. The church is a very unhealthy place to 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 work currently. Um, looking at you know the United States church and and the world church and everything, it's just not really a healthy place to work right now. But it doesn't have to be like that, and it already has started to get better. So I think that these things are things that we should you know keep in mind. Um, that, you know, yes, the church isn't where it should be, but are we going in the right direction? And I think we are going in the right right direction. The church is becoming more accepting of people with, with mental me mental health issues. You know, but the thing is, there's just this kind of this, this generation, the last generation really, that just made the church a very unpleasant place. And the thing is, the good news in all this is that they're dying off. Now, that might seem callous, but at the same time, you know, they made – the church of living hell for my entire generation and i understand why my generation is leaving but with that being said those people are dying off so it's not it's not something that's going to last for forever now however and we'll talk about this next week we are making our own mistakes that we're going to have to live with for ourselves so that's something we'll, we'll like that next week um so some things you have to grow before you get though so a lot of the a lot of the things mentioned in this powerpoint um that that your favorite heretic posted was there are some things that are offensive if you're not there yet. If you haven't reached a place of growth, you're not going to understand it. Um, and if you try and force the person to understand, they will misunderstand and then they'll get mad at you. So what, that's kind of what, what the church has tried to do in the past. 
this is how it is. You need to understand that. You don't understand that, but you're going to because I'm going to make you understand that, and I'm not going to, you know, whatever. You just have to be. And it's like people don't grow like that, and they don't really learn like that. You you kind of have to work with them and kind of give them time and give them space. And I'll give you examples so you don't think that I'm just pulling this out of my butt. Um, there's someone struggling with homosexuality, right? They, they don't know exactly how to deal with it. They don't know how to, you know, whatever. Does God hate me? Um, did God make me like this? Did I do something to deserve this? They have all these uncertainties that they're going through, right? And so then their first step is to try to ignore it. Hey, maybe I'm not really gay. So then they go to another step eventually down the line, and they get to the place of, well, I can't ignore it, so I have to embrace it. Mm. See, and it, and it makes sense when you're in that kind of a situation. I ignored it. It didn't go away, so I'm just going to accept it. You know, and you, you see a lot of Christians do this. You know, I have this problem in my life. I'm going to ignore it and, and just pray that it goes away. Well, it didn't. Okay, well, then I'm just going to live with it. And it's like, well, what if God wants us to grow from it? What if God wants us to pray in it? You know, and all those, you know, those kinds of things. And it's, ah, eh, no, it's fine. And so, you know, same thing with homosexuality. So, so then somebody like you or me comes along and we say, hey, homosexuality is a choice. And, and it's the wrong one, too. Well, then... Obviously, you guys can see where this ar this argument is going to go. The next thing they're going to say is, hey, I didn't choose to be like this. See? And so they weren't at a place of being prepared to hear. So instead, the rushed thing that was shoved at them, they just weren't at a place of, of, of growth to hear that yet. And a lot of the things that are in this, in this PowerPoint, you know, like we're going to look at one thing we're going to look at tonight is uh, giving tithes. If you are not spiritually mature, tithes is a chore. If you are spiritually mature, it mature it's a way that you worship God, and it's something that is precious. I'm, I, there's been many times when I've been giving, giving, giving tithes, and I've been, been in tears thinking about all the good things God has given me and how my money is, 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 is something so simple like my money can go so far to reach so many other people's lives. I didn't always feel like that. There was a time when tithe, giving tithes was a chore. See what I mean? I wasn't there yet. And so when people talked to me about giving tithes and being faithful in that, it was more of a nuisance than anything because I wasn't there yet. And there's a lot of things in this PowerPoint that to somebody who is not spiritually mature and then somebody comes along and says something judgmental, it's not going to go well. So then the, the the homosexual person would say something like, well, I didn't choose to be like this. And trying to force them into understanding that you live off morality rather than feelings and how they should deal with their trauma, that w whatever happened to them, that's just going to be rejected. And there's almost this idea with, with that argument, and it's not just with homosexuality, it's with a lot of different things, where they'll say something like this, love is love. Well, so you're saying sex with animals is okay, and then they'll say, well, you're a homophobe. Don't even say something like that. Don't don't compare me to somebody who has sex with animals. And it's like, well, but you just said love is love. Well, that's not what I meant. It's like, so what is the line here? And they're not they're not at a place where they feel like you can have a disagreement with, where you aren't rejecting them at their core as an individual. And um, so what's happened is our society thinks love and acceptance are the same, but they're not. And because people have all these insecurities, part of which are due to the fact that there aren't fathers in our generation, in my generation, what they do is they say, you have to accept me as I am. But this implies that they don't need to grow, and it, it implies that they have the absolute standard that they are right, and they don't need to change or, or, or learn or anything. Um, and... And the long, the long and long and short of this whole argument that, that they're that they're making Christians so judgmental and stuff is is they're saying something along the lines of this: to see someone stuck in, a, in an emotional hell because of their past trauma and leave them there because you should just accept them as they are. Most cases, if not all cases, of homosexuality are caused from a past trauma, usually with an authority figure, almost always the father, almost always. Not 100% of the time, but like 95% of the time. So you're saying they accept you as you are and not deal with that emotional trauma that you've been through. And there's a lot of this, this idea in our society right now where you can't help somebody work through their emotional trauma. You have to just embrace it. That's who they are. And it's like, but that's not who they are. That's how wounded people act. The way forward isn't to ignore it. 
the way forward is to start addressing and helping people in these kinds of situations. It's like, for instance, there, there's been some, there's been a lot of people in the past who, who have, you know, sex crisis, trying to figure out if they're a man or a woman or, you know, all these different things, which wasn't as big of an issue a generation ago, but it is in this generation. So what do Christians do? Well, you were born that way, duh. It's like, well, yeah, and, and I definitely understand what you're saying, but that's not where they're at with their emotional growth. And obviously for them to develop this kind of a crisis, you know that there's some kind of an, an emotional trauma that they need to work through. So rather than helping them, we've kind of become more or less a uh, police force, <laughs> if that's the right term. Um, you know, but it, my point being accepting them as, as they are, it's irresponsible and it's unloving. You, you should never accept where you are and just, I'm not going to grow. How I am and how I perceive things is the absolute standard. That's just not, not right. But, once again, it has to be at a point when somebody's ready. So some of these things that are in these PowerPoints aren't necessarily wrong, just maybe at the wrong point of the person's development. Um, and uh, the main point that I'm trying to make is that you don't leave wounded and, and people to bleed out. What if a child molester could be diverted before he molests? What if a child molester could be helped in such a way where he could leave that life and go on? Now, see, in our mind, we say, well, we don't, we don't help child molesters. Just kill them. Well, that's what past generations have said about homosexuals, too. Maybe not the most spiritually mature way to deal with it. I don't like it anymore, but you have to remember that in God's eyes, homosexuality and child molestation are pretty much the same – so that whole, you know, argument about killing the one and accepting the other is more based off of our own environmental conditioning than anything. Especially, you know, in the Middle East, for instance, they'll marry girls who are young, like 11 years old, yeah. young. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, not that I'm condoning it, but I am saying, you know, we have our own little standard and we think because that's the way we perceive something, that's just how it is. And that's not how it is. Um, do our emotions and failures have to define us? Oh boy. So now let's get now let's move forward to the first of the three things we're going to look at: money and finances. Now, we are very int intentional as a as a church to not do this. Okay, this whole has a sermon before or after the sermon about tithing, where you just go on and on and on about how you need to give or you're going to go to hell and all this different stuff. Oh my goodness. We very are very much so intentional not to do this. We don't even take up tithes and offering anymore. We have a um, thing at the back of the church, a little black box, and if, if you want to, you can there. If you feel self-conscious, you can do it online. If you really want, you can mail it in. I mean, whatever. <laughs> I noticed that's something with this current generation, too is most don't carry around cash. Mm -hmm. So they're like, well, I don't want to give because I don't have any cash. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it's great that, you know, we can now give online. Right. Because then it's like, like, I, I rarely carry around cash. And yeah, like, I, I don't either. I have to. No. And it's, and, I uh, noticed that's been a big issue. My dad and, uh, and Chuck both use checks, and I'm like, I don't even have a checkbook. <laughs> My mom's like, you need to order some. I'm like, mm, no. But why? Then you have to log it all, and you have to remember, and all this uh, yeah, nonsense. Was, nonsense. I, <laughs> My dad was like, I'm going to get you a checkbook, and I'm going to teach you how to do a checkbook and write, write your checks and all that stuff. And, just like, and you're like, no. But you don't want to say no because you don't. Yeah, I, I know how it is, buddy. Um, yeah, he showed me uh, for me, and I was like, yep, that's very interesting. I'm never going to do that. <laughs> and I've stuck to it. <laughs> I'll see Grandpa sitting on, his, sitting on his laptop doing checks, and he's yeah. just, like pulling out his hair like, <laughs> <laughs> And then if Mom ever forgets to log one, oh, my gosh. Okay, I'm sorry. Moving on. Um, however, with all that being said, submitting your finances to God is a necessary part of growth. You, you can't say, you know, hey, God's master of my life, but I'm going to live my life however I want. Well, it's either one or the other. I mean, you really – it doesn't work that way. Um, the Bible gives a lot of strong warnings too about worshiping you know, money and that kind of stuff and, and having it as a center of your world. Um, uh, but but giving, and giving money is a part of our worship to God. Um, and when we give our money as he directs, um, that is a necessary part of obedience. See, what we want to do is we want to pray for these big things, but then we don't actually want to have to obey God. And it doesn't work like that. You know, oh, God, move mountains. And it's like, well, you want me to do something big? You have to obey me big. You know, and we can't have it. <laughs> we can't have it our own way. Um, televangelists, though, give lots of, of 
false incentives uh, for giving. And I think that they're the biggest reason of why people have kind of gotten over tithing. Um, you know, you, you, oh, help help buy my jet so that I can live in my $10 billion mansion. It's like, well, now let's let's hold on with that. Um, and uh, so, some churches really are desperate, and, and and they deal with it poorly. You know, they're on the verge of closing their doors. They don't know how to how to deal with it, so they're just like, let's keep at, really pouring it in. You need to give your money, and it's like, well, you know, when I I've learned that as as a leader in the church, if your focus is on getting people to give, it's going to be on getting people to give. You're not going to focus on anything else. The, the, you have to be able to cross that bridge and say, God, you have to provide. We're going to teach biblically, but it's not going to be all about finances. Should you should you submit your finances to God? Absolutely. And, and is that what we're going to talk about every every month? No, not at all. There, there's just more important things. And uh, yeah, well, anyways, some church. Okay, all right. Um, so some churches exist just to exist, and so they go through these dead rituals, and it, it becomes nothing more than a continual cycle of giving, so that they can have you give again tomorrow. And my point is this: you have a church with like a pastor or whatever that's, that's barely scraping by, so then they get you to give tithes. They don't do anything in the community. They don't do anything for anybody. They don't, you know, use their money to for anything. But then they keep give, having you give tithes so that they can just have you keep giving tithes. It's a church that exists for no other reason than to exist. Our church does not do this. Yes, we, we do give tithes. We teach tithes. But we, we do community outreaches. We give to things. There's all kinds of stuff happening there. Um, we don't ask people to give just so that they can give. Giving is a part of worship, but but I'm definitely not disagreeing about the whole droning on and on and on about tithes. Just drop it already. Um, the pastors exploit tithes for mansions and luxury cars with families uh, struggle to make ends meet. Now, one thing that I need to make is – one point that I need to make is this is not all pastors. In fact, this is a very small point percent of pas pastors. And another thing I want to point out is that – some pastors are going to live in church in houses that are really, really nice because that's the area that they live in. If the houses in your neighborhood sell for $150,000, guess who's going to have a $150,000 house? What do you want them to do? Live in a street? Live in the street because they can't find a cheap house? Right. That's not reasonable. Let's say, for instance, just roll with me on this. I'm not defending Joel Osteen. I think he's a snake. But just hear me on this. What if? The city that Joel Osteen lived in, every single house was was over a million dollars. Well, then if you had a million dollar house, it wouldn't be that big of a deal because everybody had a million dollar house. The only way you could not have a million dollar house would be to not live there. But if you didn't live there, you wouldn't be the pastor there. And if you wasn't the pastor, then somebody else would be the pastor there. And the problem would, would – you see what I'm getting at, right? So you know that definitely does have to be considered, okay? This house that we are currently having this lesson in, which I've converted and, made, and tried to make make as, as user-friendly for handicapped people as possible, um, this house cost when, – when we bought it, it, with inflation now, it's way over $100,000, but we bought it at $85,000, which at the time was, was high. Um, it was worth about $75,000. I went up an extra $10,000 because they were willing to work with us on – you know what? It doesn't matter. More of the story being I overpaid a little bit at the time, and now that inflation is so high, which by the way, it's a terrible time to buy a house. Now that inflation is so high, our house is probably worth $130,000. Not because of anything special about the house, just because rates are ridiculous right now. It's a terrible time to buy a house. And with that being said, you know, that this is about the norm for, for Tularosa. I mean, this house isn't like anything like over the top. It's not a mobile home, so it's going to be more expensive than a mobile home. You know, but then that's kind of my point. So most pa pastors don't do this one, the whole exploiting ties thing. There's this idea with people who don't know what they're talking about, whether they just assume that the church has taken all this money and then the pastor rolls around on it in a big vault in the back. And <laughs> that's just not true. And uh, people who say this are typically people who don't know anything about the church's finances. They they just have strong feelings about the church's finances, but they just don't really know what those feelings are. Well, the church just shouldn't be tax exempt. Okay. Okay, let's think about this. Church is not being tax exempt while the pastor spends all of his time with people who are dying in the hospital. Okay? Church is not being tax exempt when they're doing events like Santa in the Basin. So you want us to pay taxes on all those toys that we're giving out to kids? That's insane. No, churches should not pay should not pay taxes. That's ridiculous. 
I mean, if, if construction companies can get away with being, being tax exempt, why wouldn't the church? That just doesn't make sense. But people who, once again, don't understand finances, they have all these addendums and rules that they think that the church should follow. And it's like, no, just, just no, no. Anyways, most pastors and churches don't do this. But the ones that do, they do it to the excess. The Osteens, the Copelands, oh my goodness. You, you, you should deprive yourself as a leader and live at or below what others live at. That 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 is true. You you shouldn't. There should be a point when you say I have enough and that's okay. I don't need another raise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but with that being said, there are even way more churches who actually don't even pay their pastors and don't pay them what they're worth as it is. For instance, when I was working at the church over 40 hours a week, we're talking 60-something plus hours a week, guys. I was making pennies. And when I cut way back, I didn't make any less or any more on my salary. See what I mean? So now I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get over, you know, my mental health issues while, you know, <laughs> not making any more or any less, you know. And, 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 you know, the truth is, is that I could make a lot more money working somewhere else. My dad could make a lot more. He was making a lot more money working somewhere else. <laughs> You know, and so for the most part, this doesn't really happen. So I really don't think it's a fair thing to point out something that a televangelist does. I mean, I've seen televangelists that smoke and drink. That doesn't mean that we should, you know, have this as a, oh, that's something that the church is doing wrong. No, it's something that a fake is doing wrong. There's lots of things that fakes do wrong. You know, I, I know lots of false prophets. You want to go through all the things that they're doing wrong too? <laughs> Anyways, um, so a, a leader should deprive themselves and live at or below what others live at. I think that's absolutely true. Um, churches shouldn't exist as nothing more than donation stations. And unfortunately, this is a, this is the case for a lot of churches. Is They're just in a place of, you know, oh, give, 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 when there's really no quote-unquote return for the give. You know what I mean? Like in, in the in the Bible, for instance, where where the church where the church had to sustain itself because they were ostracized by their community, they could people couldn't have jobs, people were overlooked. Well, now there's like there's uh, welfare and that kind of stuff. It's a lot different. But back then, the church really only got help by itself. So when people like Barnabas came along and they sold all of their land to help the church, this was a major thing. And, uh, you know, times have changed in, in, in history. I mean, you, you can't just ignore the historical context and say, well, Christians should live with nothing and pastors should live with nothing too. That's not what Paul said. Paul said, hey, you shouldn't you, – you, even, even an animal should be able to have food while it's working. How much more – you know, did he write this just for the animals? Of course not. How much more should a pastor also get paid for the work that he does? And I'm not saying that as a pastor. I had that same feeling before I was a pastor. And I won't always be a pastor. And I'm going to have that same feeling when I'm not a pastor too. So, you know, there's that. Um, telling you God will honor your finances if you start giving more to the church. Oh, this one irritates me so bad. Always misquoting verses to do it too. If you give in tithes and offering, the God's going to make your bank account overflow. It's like, what are you talking about, man? Oh, man. Anyways. The truth is that if you honor God in your life, yes, you will find him blessing you in areas. That doesn't mean that you're going to have money out the wazoo. I think one thing I've heard is uh, some uh, people told me if you don't uh, give your money to God, then he'll, uh, he'll like uh, destroy you or something or like he'll uh, cripple your life. Also. Well, no, no, I do understand what you're saying. But with that being said, I have seen – I have seen in my life plenty of people who – just they refused to give tithes. I'm not talking about young Christians. I'm not talking about older Christians who knew better. And God had dealt with them, and they're just like, no, I'm not going to do that. It's my money. And God did bring things by to, well, to teach him a lesson. Like one guy, for instance, here's a good example. He owed, it was an exact amount. It was like, let's say $337 to God in tithes, and he wasn't going to pay it. So he had, a, it was a barn that, that burned down. And to rebuild it cost him Three hundred and thirty-seven dollars to the dime, exactly what he owed in tithes. That that is not something a, a story I pulled out of my hat. That that's a real story that happened. That that's something for real. And it's not the only thing that I've seen where where somebody hardened their heart towards God and wouldn't pay tithes, and God had His own little ways of telling him, "Oh, you're not going to get away with that. I want your whole life." And God doesn't care about the money. God cares about the heart. And uh, so, but I do know what you're talking about, though. People will sometimes make it into a thing of you know. What don't they make into a thing? Scare tactics. Like everything. Read your Bible or God's going to hate you. Go to church or God's going to hate you. Give your tithes or God's going to hate you. It's like, you know, your, your God is very fickle. 
Goodness sakes. Anyways, um, God will bless you in other ways when you aren't bound to your money, and that's absolutely true. And honestly, being bound to your money is one of the worst curses you can live with. When your life is all about your money, it's just like a huge weight. You worry about losing it. You, you worry about – I mean it's just a, a constant weight and oppression, and, and you, no matter how much you have, you always need more. And it's just like, ah, it's like a constant hell that you live in. Well, thankfully, when we you know, you know, know, give it to God, it's just like this huge weight that's lifted. But for goodness sakes, I, like this la last year, not this year, but last year, uh, you had a bunch of these false, you know, teachers saying, you know, hey, give your stimulus checks to, to me and God will bless you. And here's the thing, I, maybe not out here, but a lot of the people that I knew elsewhere in the world were literally having to live off, of, live off the stimulus checks, not going out and buying TVs or cars or whatever other. I mean, they literally, the government made it where they couldn't sustain themselves. They backed them up into a wall. They were screwed. And then the stimulus check came in, and they were able to, you know, at least float their beer, bills for a little bit until they could go back to work. I'm not talking about people who, once they could get a job, didn't. I'm saying people who had a job. They just weren't allowed to go to it because of the government's interference. That's different. Yeah. Anyways. The only thing money-wise that I was, like, I, I, I'm scared of is, like, if, uh... Yeah, we all go into that place, but remember that some of that is going to be an area where you have to learn to trust God. And another part of that is going to be where you have to learn to make wise decisions and not make foolish decisions, which is kind of a flip, flip of the coin. And then another part of that is just being young and being scared of the uncertainty of life. And you'll grow out of a lot of that, and you'll learn from a lot of that, and you will make mistakes, and you will lose a lot of money, and you'll be in a, pl a lot of places where you think, oh, God, how am I going to get through this? And then God will get you through it. And then God will get you through it, and it won't be so bad. So uh, the next one is sin watching. Now, we've all been to churches, I think, where you go in the door, and you've got people just breathing down your neck. I mean, it doesn't matter what you do, it's wrong. And they're going to tell you about it. And uh, so, the, but once again, the, the things that made it onto the PowerPoint aren't necessarily those things. So, let's try to get through this. Told your sin was hindering you from experiencing God. Well, the thing is, sometimes sin does hinder us from experiencing God. That's something that the Bible itself says. And that's something that the Christian Bible and the Christian God teach. So, to deny that would actually be you don't like Christianity. Now, once again... You don't have to follow Christianity. There's a lot of religions out there. But this is the way Christianity teaches. And we don't have to change Christianity's doctrines to make somebody less offended. That's just the way it is. Um, that's what the prophet said. This is a thing that is actually true. Christianity is offensive. It's offensive that I don't get to live however I want. And when, when, we, make it when we make it more offensive, that's on us. So the, the Bible is offensive and then I'm going to say it in a rude way where it offends you. That Well, that's my fault then. I could have presented wisdom in a wise way. Um, the death of, of self, which is what Christianity is, dying daily, the death of self isn't something easy. Jesus said to count the cost before you take up the cross. That, that's a very important thing. Jesus actually said that. Consider this before you do it. You know, and, and for, for Jesus himself to say, you know, I came to save the world, but hey, before you take me up on that altar, uh, that, that offer, you might want to you might want to weigh this out before you do it. I think that if God himself said that, we might want to think about considering what he said. Maybe that's just me. Um, told it created a stronghold for the devil or demon center into your life. There are some things, which once again, I don't think that this is what the PowerPoint is talking about. I think what the PowerPoint is talking about is is you know people who sit over your shoulder and, and they just can't wait to point out your, your, your mistakes and everything and then say, oh, well, you, you're giving the devil a foothold. But with that being said, some things do create opportunity for the devil in your life. Like, for instance, Ouija boards. We've looked at this before in great detail. I do not own a Ouija board. I don't own those kinds of demonic things. I don't let them in my house. You know. And now, with that being said, a lot of Christians have taken this to the extreme, and they make it, they call everything demonic. You know, that's demonic. What is this demonic nonsense? What's this demonic nonsense? It's like, well, now hold on. Not everything that you don't like is demonic. And uh, so, anyways. When an old Christian allows a place for sin in their life, like, for instance, gossip, it does create problems. When you've been saved for a while, God expects more from you. And when you, are, as a mature Christian, decide to take a step back and allow something into your life that shouldn't be there, God's going to deal with you harsher than somebody who's been in the church for five years. That's just the way of it. 
uh, if you don't think that it's fair, you know, imagine this. This is how the church has operated. A new Christian comes and comes in. Let's say baby Paul, right? He's two years old. He comes in and you say, you know, wipe your own butt, feed yourself, get a job. He's two years old. And then at the same time, you being a 50-year-old saying, well, you should have to clean up my messes. And that's exactly what's happened in the church. You have older Christians who are supposed to be the example, not being the example. And so you have this kind of this kind of this this rift that's happening between the generations because the older Christians have rejected what God has told them to do to help raise up the younger Christians. Those 50, 60, 70, 80 year old Christians, they're supposed to be nurturing us younger people. They're not. They haven't been for years. They've been despising us and criticizing us on everything. See what I mean? They've rejected that mantle that God has given them. And so now here we are, and they're standing over our, our backs and over those who are even younger than us, saying all the thing that we're doing wrong, that's 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 foolishness. That's foolishness. You don't expect a two year old to do the same thing that a fifty year old does. That's just that's just foolish. Um, usually this is used as a means of shaming. Those who are weaker or younger instead of focusing on the older Christians that have refused to grow and become more like Christ. So in other words, the older people who should know better, let's ignore that. But let's shame people who are young and weak. Young and weak in their faith, right? Here's a good example. I was drinking a thing of oat milk the other day. And it had the image of a goddess on it. And it said that it was named after this specific goddess to give honor back to the earth. Now... Some Christians might see that and they say, well, I'm not drinking that milk anymore. And Paul actually had a very similar debate in his day about whether they should eat the meat that was offered to, to a, a god or not. And Paul said this. He said, we know that there aren't really any, uh, any gods, but if somebody's conscience is weak, then they should abstain from the meat. And you shouldn't ask about the meat just so that it doesn't bring it up to their conscience and it doesn't bother them. Because if you eat the meat and it does bother their conscience, well, then you just hurt your brother who Christ died for. See what I mean? And he says this. He says that the one who lives by stronger regulations, they're weaker. The one who lives by less restrictions is stronger. In other words, this. That thing of milk. I could have gotten offended about it and let it bother my conscience, and that would have made me weak. Or I could have ignored it and realized that there are no, no other gods except for the one. And that would have made me stronger. See what I mean? But if it's something that bothered my conscience, then I shouldn't have drank it, which it didn't. But anyways, um, well, I guess it did at first. I was thinking, uh, demon milk. <laughs> <laughs> but you get what I'm saying. So now, now the next thing. And so told it, it, it created a stronghold for the devil or demon center into your life. That that really does depend on what we're talking about. When a when somebody who's been in the church for 30 years starts gossiping, that is allowing an opportunity for the devil to use you to tear down somebody else, and God's not going to bless you for it. When a young Christian gossip, it's, it's, I mean, obviously God's going to start dealing with them about it, but honestly, it's not going to be that big of a deal because they're just a baby Christian. God's going to work with them, and they're going to grow, and it's all fine. But when they harden their heart, that's the problem. So uh, felt, uh, felt guilt, fear, shame, or self-hatred for sin because church hyper-focused on it. Oh, boy. Yeah. All churches do this to some degree at different times. I'll give you a good example. The Bible has very strong teachings against divorce. So what the church has historically done, and I've been guilty of it too, so focused on, don't get a divorce. Well, what about the people who already have gotten one? See? And so instead, those people are just in a place where they feel more and more guilt and shame for what they did in the past that they can't fix. It's done. Most people who get a divorce don't remarry back to each other. Usually, if they get a divorce, it's, it's the end of the road. So with that being said, it's like, See what I mean? Hyper-focused on it, and now the person feels guilt and shame. It doesn't really help. Don't be gay, but what about those who are struggling with homosexual feelings? Well, just don't be gay. Okay, I understand that, but what about if I'm already dealing with... See what I mean? So now all that's happened is an ignoring of the problem and making the person feel feel more guilty. Only And, and what happens is leaders, especially pastors, I speak as a pastor on this part, you start only preaching to those who already agree with your views instead of listening to people. I'll give you a great example of, of how us pastors do this all the time. Somebody comes to us for counseling. We already know everything that they're doing wrong and what they need to fix before they even say, say a word. 
If you've ever counseled somebody, you know the danger of this. You, you, you go through people who are in the exact same situation over and over again, and it's hard to remember to slow down and listen to them for five seconds. Well, me and my husband are having this. Yeah, I, I, I know. Let me guess. You're not doing this, this, or this. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a pretty simple thing, but you know, you, you get what I'm, what I'm saying. Yeah, it's a pretty simple thing. You should have already had this figured out. Well, for somebody who sits in counseling all day, you know, talking to the same people about the same problems, you know, it, it may seem a lot more simple. Everybody sins and no one is good except God alone. We should instead restore and help one another. We, should, not, we shouldn't be telling people about how hopeless it is. Some older Christians only want to hear about how they are perfect and everyone else needs to change. I've been in a lot of churches that were like that. You know, oh, well, don't tell me that what I'm doing is wrong. Maybe the reason why your church is shrinking is because you are like you are. Have you ever thought about changing? Oh, no, I shouldn't have to change. People should change before they come to our church. So you don't actually want to reach the next generation, do you? Well, there's more that could be said on that. We did Santa in the Basin last week, and there was a Santa Claus there. And there were some older people who were more upset about the way that we let a Santa in the building than the fact that we reached a bunch of families. Which is more important? Do I think Santa Claus is real? No. Do I tell my kids that he's real? No. I've told them since day one. I've said Santa isn't real. There was a guy that lived a long time ago. He died, and now people dress up like this to make it more fun. I don't lie to them about it. What but about the mole? I'm still about the mole. <laughs> yeah, no, dude. Freya seriously was like that. She's like, look, Santa, I'm going to go home and tell Dad and Daddy that Santa is real. And it's like, no, uh, it's a guy in a suit. Oh, God. <laughs> but anyways, should, anyways. Moral of the story that. being, for that older guy, it was more important that that the church didn't get up on its soapbox and say santa you know whatever but those uh so you know there's a lot of older people who think that you think that you need to tell, tell to keep telling them over and over again how the young generation is just retarded and how they need to change everything but how they're doing everything right but those struggling looking for hope shouldn't be met with judgment um should be met with judgment and condemnation. Hey, it's okay for me to be in the church my whole life and to still be bitter and nasty, but uh, you know, if somebody else comes in the church, you make sure that they that they that they feel judged and condemned so that God can change them. Oh, okay. That that's that's one theory. <laughs> we definitely should not be sin watchers, but at the same time, we are accountable to one another, and we're accountable for one another. So with that being said, whereas we shouldn't be watching over each other's backs to make sure that each other is getting caught and you know to make sure other people are tripping up, we should definitely be watching out for one another. I, I see that you're struggling in this area. Is there something I can help you with? The Bible even talks about this. You see a brother in sin, go and talk to them. Try try and help persuade them. If it doesn't work, you know, take somebody else with you and turn you know start getting more more involved in this. Um, but I will say this, it's a lot easier to talk to somebody about something if you know them and you're, you're their friends. Like, for instance, I feel a lot more comfortable talking to Nicole about something than, for instance, uh, you know, the newcomer who came last Sunday. I don't know that person. I know Nicole. I've known her for years. I, I feel like if there was something that, that she was doing that I would be able to talk to her and say, Hey, Nicole, you know, I feel like you're doing this. Uh, you know, is there what's going on there? You know, but you get what I'm saying. And when you're when you're friends with people, it's a lot easier to connect. And so you have these older people in churches that are shrinking, that don't want to connect with with anybody, and you know, then they still want to have a say in their in their life, and that's just not how it works. Um, and we should definitely help each other. So the last thing that we're going to be talking about now, this is definitely absolutely something that is plagued the church for years obsession with spiritual gifts and warfare right there's demons behind every door behind everything there's a demon oh if something bad happens to you then it's probably spiritual attack now here's the thing many times we ignore spiritual attacks in our life and sometimes even to the point of stupidity where something's going on and we just fail to take in that satan is definitely trying to trying to destroy us maybe he caused the thing maybe he's just using the thing that happened i don't know but either way to to think that Satan is looking at us, you know, without any concern one way or another is just stupid. 
you know, Revelation, I just got done re reading Revelation today, and it, ta it describes Satan as a dragon who's raving around the world because, uh, seeking who he can destroy because he knows that his time is short. That's how the book of Revelation describes Satan. That's not a very hopeful image. So, yeah, yes, you know, people do take it, but sometimes we just ignore spiritual attacks. Life has struggles that aren't related to spiritual attacks, though. You're going to have health issues or, you know, concerns and stuff that... It's not like Satan is like, ha, 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 you know, and it's just like, but some, but still, you have to realize that Satan will see any opportunity. You know what I mean? You're, you're disappointed about something that happened at work, and so, you know, somebody just happens to come by and says something real snide that, that tears you down. But Satan still wants to use whatever you're going through to destroy you. Everything, everything, though, is an opportunity for faith. Is this a spiritual attack? Is it not a spiritual attack? It doesn't matter. Everything is an opportunity for faith. Everything. No matter what you're going through, it's an opportunity for faith. Some things are consequences of our choices. Some things are consequences of other people's choices. And demons are definitely not behind every door. Watching or reading things like Harry Potter will invite the demonic into your life. Oh, boy. I have... Uh, I'm going to say a few different things, okay? Okay. First off, I have no strong feelings about Harry Potter either way. I've never read it. Grace has read the first couple books. There are some things in Harry Potter that obviously aren't the greatest things to be you know, reading about. For instance, there's a part, if I understand correctly, with uh, somebody being demon-possessed. Um, it, it, it's not... It's, it's coming across as she's having a, like... Um, She's telling the future, mm -hmm. but the way it comes across is she her face is changed, mm -hmm. and she speaks it in a different voice, and after it's over, she doesn't remember it happening. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't say she's demon possessed. It's saying that she's you know foretelling the future, but you know understanding the demonic side of things, you're like oh she she just. You now see the, see this is where this is where it gets into a very complicated issue and I'm actually working on a lesson about it. I'll probably put it on my YouTube. I probably won't put it in teach it in yams about where the line is for fantasy because Harry Potter doesn't happen in our world. It happens in another world. And in that hypothetical world, let's say for instance Yahweh isn't God in that hypothetical world. It's a made up world where there maybe there isn't a God. Maybe there's just you know magic or something. I don't know. Whatever. You, you see what I mean? So in that way you could you could get around it. But at that with that being said, it's hard because growing up this was the solution to everything. It's of the devil. Um, you know. The Holy Spirit doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't possess us. He uses us. You know those, those typical Christian things, which are all true, they're good theology. But that Harry Potter isn't a book of theology, and you, you see what I mean. It, it's not as it's not as black as and black and white as that generation made it. And that's the hard part of it. Will of Time, fantasy book series. I, I really enjoy reading, although the show is mostly trash. I said it. I said it. Uh, uh, they are fighting the dark one. The devil, if you will. And people who serve him. Okay. It just gets complicated, and I, I don't really want to go too far off onto this. So let me reel myself back in. Some things that you allow in your house or, or whatnot that will cause nightmares, will cause ocular phenomena, things that you see... Um, they will uh, they will bring spiritual attacks, but not necessarily everything. Harry pa Potter has some things in it that are very questionable, but I don't know. Um, it might not be the best idea to be messing with that kind of stuff, but I, I don't really know for sure. I'm just kind of somewhere in the middle. Maybe if like 10 is strong, disagree and one is strong agree maybe i'm not quite five out of ten maybe i'm more like 5.5 .5 or six I, I don't know uh, there is a difference between fantasy elements and the occult though but i don't know see some things if you have trouble in your conscience then don't do it if you're reading harry potter and you're like this does not bode well in my heart don't do it i was reading a book that i was very excited about 
And the basic idea was that he went to hell to fight demons so that he could train to be a better warrior. I got a little bit eh, uncomfortable there, so I stopped reading it. I'm not saying that everybody shouldn't read that book. I'm just saying I didn't feel overly comfortable reading about this guy going to going to hell. I've talked to too many people who have nightmares because they were watching something that had demons in it, and I'm just like, no, I'm not going to take that chance. I don't have a problem sleeping right now. I don't want to have a problem <laughs> sleeping right now. So, you know, I erred on the side of caution. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there was nothing wrong with that book. I don't know. But I just, I'm not having any problems, sleeping problems. <laughs> See what I mean? So I mean, it seems like I won. Um, but if you have a, tr a trouble in your conscience, then by all means, don't do it. And don't condone what the Bible warns against, like, for instance, seances. So let's say, for instance, Harry Potter has a scene. I, I don't know if it does. I'm just, we're going on the hypothetical train again. Um, and they call to the dead and have a conversation with somebody who's dead. A seance. Okay. It's not okay to condone that kind of stuff just because you really like the series. Does that kind of make sense? What we do is if we like something enough, it's okay. A good example, I was uh, we were talking to somebody a few months ago, and there was this, this false teacher that was trying to get trying to get a place in the church, and we were just like, yeah, that's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And um, the person was the person was saying, oh, but they're really nice. I really like them. See, they were under the assumption that just because they liked the person that made them not a false teacher. It's like Joyce Meyer. Joyce Meyer is very nice. I, I, I find a lot of her lessons very enjoyable. However, I've looked up what she teaches about Jesus and about God, and I have con I am convinced that she's a false teacher. She is not teaching the Bible. She's she's not on top. So I'm convinced. I still like her as a person, but she's wrong. See, we have this thing where if we like something, that like gives it a clear all. You know, I like this person, so they can't be a false teacher. Uh, no, 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 no. I have seen a lot of people watching stuff and having their kids impacted with nightmares. Um, I've uh, seen a lot of where, thing where, where they'll see or, or fill things in the house. Um, one person had they their parents used to was a was a Wiccan, and they they always saw this thing in like a foggy something like like a cloud of dust or something in, up in the corner and they're like that's weird well as they grew up they moved on and they didn't think about it well anyways the mom uh went on to have another kid or a grandkid or something like that that lived in that in that room again and they said there's this funny cloud in, in that same spot this is 20 years later and the per and the and the and the, the person was like nope nope they just got up and they left they're like nope not doing it <laughs> and you know so that would be a good example of you know uh, of a demonic activity in the house movies that glorify demons and evil and try to make you scared it, it's not good to be scared and if you try too hard to make yourself scared eventually you might find you might find yourself in a position where you genuinely are scared <laughs> so i mean with that being said you know i, I don't know this is a foggy spot okay believe whatever you want uh, I was reading a book that had this blood binding ritual, and I felt very uncomfortable about it, and so I stopped reading it. And um, you know, it because of my studies in the occult, um, I I know about some things, and I just don't feel comfortable, you know, accepting those kinds of things into my life. I just like nope. Um, there was another book I was reading that had a pentagram with a goat head on it, um, and the guy was chained onto it, and I was just like, I got to that part, and I'm like. Then, <laughs> uh, not today, Satan. <laughs> I just didn't didn't feel good about it. So you know, here's the thing. I, I I'm gonna say this about the whole reading and watching things. Go to it with prayer. That's the first thing. Number two, if it bothers your conscience, don't excuse it. Just stop. And number three, if it's clearly demonic, don't risk it. You don't lose anything by not reading a certain book or not watching a certain movie. It's not like your your life is going to be less spectacular because you've never seen The Exorcist. It, it, it's okay. It's all right. You get what I'm saying. So anyways, told tongues and prophecies are for all believers and felt less than for not experiencing that. Well, see, this is a little bit of a – little bit of a – the Bible tells us that tongues and prophecy are for everybody. It Now, once again, though, that doesn't mean that everybody will, just that it's for everybody. So – you know, that brings us to the second part of the sentence. Felt less than for not experiencing that. Yeah, this happened to Ben. 
you know, somebody tried to really try to get him to speak in tongues, and he's like, ah, you know, so they just kept pressuring him and pressuring him, and he's like, ah, and then finally just, like, made something up so they'd leave him alone because, you know, I mean, what would you do in a situation like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pass out. Oh, uh, you know, and then, say, but. Just no, yeah, I've actually seen people do that, just fall over so that people leave them alone. And then as soon as the people go away, they just like, okay, get up and like scurry off. I'm just saying sometimes prayer circles get kind of weird. You can't scurry off. You have to lay there for an hour. <laughs> did you really? Yeah, I did. For an hour you laid there? They push me down and I'm just like, okay, I'm going to lay here until everybody else is done. And then I'm going to get up and they're going to be like, hey. One time, Gracie, I was at a I was at a youth camp and I was praying. At youth camp. <laughs> yeah, I bet you it did. One time, I was at a youth camp and I was praying and I fell asleep while I was playing, praying and people thought that I was really having a spiritual encounter. <laughs> so my at the time it was my girlfriend. Her brother was there and the mom was too. And so the mom told the brother that uh, he should go up and support me. So he's oh, all no. sitting next to me. No, no, he wasn't weird. No, I mean, oh no. And he just sits there, and then he just puts his hand on me, you know. Well, I end up waking up, and he's there, and I'm just like, oh, dude. And he's like, did you fall asleep? And I was like, yeah, I'm just so tired. <laughs> I didn't mean to. We were running around outside all day. I barely got any sleep. I woke up too early. We were in the mountains. I mean, come on. Anyways, tongues and prophecy are for all believers, but not everybody will be used in them, and that's okay. It, it, it's it's not a thing where it's on demand, and they're not always going to do it even when people are used in it. And uh, it's sometimes it's only going to be at certain points in your life. Some people, for instance, you know, they'll have like this this thing that, that they do at one point in their life, and then they never do it again. That's okay. I have seen a lot of Christians who were used um, who were used to get seriously. Uh, I'm sorry, who were used in things like like prophecy and stuff, then get seriously tempted. And get bad attitudes and drop out. And the mark for them was that they stopped giving words and, and whatnot. So God was using them in a certain area, and then they got a bad attitude, and then they, God stopped using them, and then they backed out. See, now, that doesn't happen with everybody, and just because somebody isn't giving a word doesn't mean that they're not being used by God or that you know, they're less or whatever. The Holy Spirit – now, here, here's something that people misunderstand. The Holy Spirit isn't a corrupting influence. There's some people who think that the Holy Spirit, it, when you en encounter him, that it eventually like erodes you inside and like it's a corrupting influence. That's not true. What happens is that people who are used um, by the Holy Spirit sometimes forget to trust God and they stop seeking after him. And then they get into a place of facing stronger temptations in, uh, in greater degrees. And because they're not adequ adequately preparing for it, they fall. See, the thing is, is the more God uses you, the more you have to pray. The more God uses you, the more you have to grow. If you're trying to just maintain and then God uses you and then you just stop reading your Bible and stop praying, well, what do you think is going to happen? That's not the Holy Spirit's fault for, quote unquote, corrupting you. That's your fault for when the Holy Spirit started using you, backing off. And I've seen a lot of people do it. Our pride really gets gets the best of us. However, all believers have a measure of the Holy Spirit in their lives. When you were saved, first off, there was the Holy Spirit who led you to salvation. Second off, every believer has a measure of the Holy Spirit in their lives. It's what causes you to change. It's what causes you to to accept the word of truth. It's the, all those things. That's the Holy Spirit. Um, and so there aren't different classes of Christians and the Holy Spirit is the one who decides to give gifts anyways, not us. We don't get to just pick and choose. Like, I'm going to be a healer. I'm declaring it in faith. It's like, well, that's not really how it works. Um, there aren't different classes of Christians and none of that nonsense. Uh, felt uncomfortable or pressured to worship in an outwardly expressive way. Now, we just talked about this with the faking the being slain in the spirit thing. And how many times have you been at, like, a conference, for instance, and you felt... Like you had to either worship vocally or not worship vocally, depending on who was around you. Come on. We've all been in this boat. So uh, one thing that I experienced myself was having to be, march around the room. Oh, my gosh. Was that awkward? But, uh, you know, I was like 11 years old, dragged out of my seat. What was I going to do? Just like jerk away from her? I didn't have those kinds of <laughs> – <laughs> What were you going to say something? No, oh. Um, the thing is worship in whatever way you want. 
and 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 that's fine and let others worship as they want that that's fine too but there's some things that should definitely be stopped um there was one uh, church i went to and this every time that the the spirit was quote unquote moving the ah! And it's like, oh my gosh. And it would echo through the whole building. And it was just so distracting and awkward. Yes, that would be something that you'd be like, yeah, can we not do that? <laughs> like, and don't tell me that the Holy Spirit did that. No, 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 no. He does, he's not, like, chaotic and crazy. Like, no, no. Um, another thing is real showy dances. You know, there was this one woman at a church that I went to. <gasps> and it's like, oh my gosh, demon! Uh, I had a Greek professor who ta told me about one service that he was in, and, and there were people ping themselves and calling it holy urination. There's just a lot of things like that that, yeah, those things should be stopped. That's not really worshiping God in whichever way you see fit. <laughs> That's more of being weird. Knock it off. <laughs> I mean, even Paul argues that people shouldn't all speak in tongues in the same service because people who come in are going to say, these people are crazy and they're going to leave. If G if Paul was saying that about if not everybody speaking tongue in tongues, do you think you'd give the seal of okay about peeing yourself, making loud shrieking noises, or, you know, having this like catatonic fit of dancing? I mean, come on. Uh, Christianity shouldn't be about impressing others, though. Uh, it shouldn't be about going through rituals. It shouldn't, or, or, or being. It shouldn't also. Sh it also shouldn't be about being good enough. It should be about the pursuit of God with love. And I was reading in First John this week, and it said this: If you love God, then you will sacrifice yourself for others. I always heard it this way growing up. It. This is how the how the teachers all and the pastors always said it: If you love God, you will sacrifice your life for God. That's not what First John says. If you love God, you will sacrifice your, your life for others as Christ sacrificed his life for you. That's the very first time that I saw that in 1 John. I was like, what? <laughs> and that blew me away. Um, 1 John just has this flow of thought that how you worship God is shown in how you treat people. It's like this never-ending circle. But anyways, and so next week we're gonna we're gonna close up. Hopefully, that's my 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 hope. We're gonna close up the the talk on religious abuse. Any questions about this? No. I'm gonna stop the recording. I'm I'm gonna do it. I'm not joking. I'm gonna do it. <laughs>